All right, so this will start as revision to what we've done. So we want to, so how do you remember, how do you now, we want to build a, an end-to-end -end machine learning last for ridge regression. How do we do that? Now we have the data. The last column in this case is the target. What do you, what's the first thing you do? Suppose we are ready to build the model. What's the first thing you do? We, we process it. We convert um, the values because you can see that the values are, they are not in the same scale. range, right? So we need to, yeah, in range, yes. So we need to- But is that the first thing you do? So how do you, how do you scale it? How do you uh, normalize it? Is that the first thing we are supposed to do? No, it's not the it's not the first thing we are supposed to do. So but I uh, just want to go. Okay, okay let's, put, let's get... put it. Let's put let's put the steps that we want to do because that you you need to know the steps. So number okay. one, what's the first num number one? What do we do? Data dot shape. Okay. What? That data dot shape. What do you mean by data dot shape? As in to get the rows and the columns. And yeah, that's step now. So I mean, you are ready to build the model. Okay. What are the steps that you will do? Uh, that is what, um, important, as in importing the the package that we need to process the to process the oh. data. I think the first thing you need to do is to get get the features and the okay. and the targets. Hmm? Okay. So, but if if we do that before that one, uh, is there would there be anything before wrong? what? If we get if we convert if we scale it before we we separate it um into the futures and the and the targets, is there? Would there okay, be let me scroll down and show you. See the data we work with here. Okay. So under the data preparation, before data preparation, what did we do? We split, we got the features and we got the targets. After that, we split it into training and testing. It was after we split it that we are now scaling, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah, but you okay, are jumping okay. to step three. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. so yes, get the features, the features are the variables in your data. The target is what we are interested in predicting. So when we do that, the next thing is we split into, let's say, let's see if, we, okay, this data, I don't know if it's much. Let me check the shape. Let me check the shape to see. I want to see if we can split into three. Oh, it's a very small data. But let me, let me just show the idea of splitting into three sets, okay? So splitting, split, split into training, validation, and test set, okay? We'll, we'll do into three sets. The next thing, we'll scale the data, right? Yes, sir. And the next thing, we build the model. Am I right? Yes, sir. But did you show us how to do validation? Mr. Emmanuel, did we? Yes. Yes, sir. And Use, using the, the test, the test data sets, you are validating the, the model. Yeah, but I will see go through that again. But I have. Okay. So but okay. we'll do that again. All right. So the first thing, let's get the features and the target. That's step one. So step one, get the features and the target. Okay, so let's have the features. We'll call in our data. We drop just the last column, the um, MEDV column. We drop that, MEDV. We specify the axis. The axis is one. Okay? And then- Yes, sir. This the last of the last one here is optional, which is to convert it to numpy array. You may choose not to use the dot values, but if you want to convert it to numpy array, use dot values. The essence of the conversion is that uh, numpy arrays are actually very they are faster to train 
compared to a data frame, but it's optional. So then we have target from, so just uh, calling the, the target, which is MEDV, we can also convert that one to the values. So if we run this now, you can check it. Let's check the first two. So you can't use dot add again because it's a NumPy array. So that's why I have to use the indexing method we have, we have done before, which is square bracket colon. I just pass in, I want to check just two, two rows. So this was, this is still similar to what we have there. It just like converted it to standard form, 0 0.00632. You just change it to 6.32 times 10 raised power minus three. So it's the same. You just converted it to, to an array four. Are we on the same page? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. The next step, split into training, testing. So we want to split into three sets instead of the two sets we've been doing before. Split into three sets. Okay. What are three sets? Train, validation, and test sets. So which function help us to, to split? The SKLN. X, SKLN. So SKLN is the package. There is a function that helps us to, to, to do the splitting. What's the function? Mr. Emmanuel. Are you there? Yes, sir. You forgotten. Train, train underscore test. So we call it train test split. So okay. that train yeah, test yes. split is the function, but it is inside a module. And the module is called model selection. That model selection module is in the package called SKLN, scikit-learn. So we call, we, that's what you, so you first talk, call the package that scikit-learn from scikit-learn What's the module? You see, model selection. You see, I, I'm not memorizing. From psychic learn model selection. So model selection is the module that has many things. It has many models and it has the function to help us split the data. From there, we import, press tab. I have train test splits. Are we on the same page? Yeah. So this yes, function sir. will help us split the data into the train and test. So the first time we are splitting, we want to split into X train and X test. Then Y train, Y test. I'll first split into two sets because that function can only split into two sets at a time. So I will pass, I will call the function train test split I want, I will first pass in my features to split into X train and X test. Then I will also pass in my target to split that target into Y train and Y test. Now I want you to, I want you to use the default or I can simply say, okay, use 80% for train and 20% for test. So I have to specify my test size to be 0 0.2. So this means it's going to use 80% of the features and target and do that into X train and Y train. And then 20% into X test and Y test. And when we can specify our seed, this seed is just for reproducibility. It's not doing anything. Are we together? Yeah. Now remember- yes, sir. I, I want to also split in, I want to get a validation set. So validation set is gotten from the training set, not the testing. So that's because I want to, I want to get three sets instead of the two set we have been used so that we will use the final test set for prediction. We we'll use this one for building the model. We we'll use this one to adjust the parameters of the model to make the model perform better. And we we'll use this last one to predict, to make prediction. Are we good? So I will split now, I want to split again. I will split the training into training and validation. 
I'm not going to touch the test set, the 20%. So from out of the 80% of the training, I will divide them into two to get some parts for validation. Do you understand? Or do you have a question? I understand, sir. Okay, good. So I call it S train and S val now. And then I call it Y train and Y val. So this time I will call the train test split again. But instead of features, what do you think I will pass? What do I want to train. split? X train. S train. S train. Exactly. Because I want to split the training into training. I want to cut some part of that training to give to validation. So is now is this one I'm going to pass now, X train. And then and, y -train. And, and then Y train. Y train. Yes. Then I can. Um, I, I don't need to specify the test. I can use 20, 75% of it for the training and the remaining 25 for validation. Or if I want to, I can still say, okay, my test size is still going to, I can specify this same argument, but leave it. Okay, I can just specify my random state. So this one we use 75, 25 now. 75% will be for the training. 25% will be for the validation. So if we run this two now, we can check. So let's check the shape of the three sets we have. Okay, x val dot shape, then x test dot shape. So now we have 303 records to build the model. We have 101 to adjust the parameters of the model, and we have 102 to finally make prediction. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, good. So now we've achieved step two. What's step three? Scale the data, right? Okay. So- uh, Again, please, can you put number three there so it doesn't confuse us? Oh, okay, that's right. And then this is number four, which is always the last step. Okay, so number three will scale the data. Which function? Now, the, this one, there are several functions. Which functions or functions do we use to scale the data? The uh, scalar. So mean max, mean max um, scalar. We have mean max scalar. Which other one? We have um, standard scalar. Exactly. So do you remember the module that we get those functions from? Preprocessing. Exactly. And the preprocessing is a module in which package? SQLearn. That's SQLearn. right. Ex that's right. Do you, do you get the idea now, Mr. Alize? Yes. There is a package and there are modules inside the package and then there are functions inside the module. So from SKLN, that's the package. Dot, if you press tab, you see the preprocessing, that's the module. We import functions now. There are several functions, but we want mean mass scalar. So let's use mean mass scalar. If you want standard scalar, you can also use that. So when you import that, because it's a class, so you have to create an instance of the class so that we can use it. So we have, let's name it scalar. So we have mean mass scalar. And then we'll now use it to scale, scale the, so we are going to scale, because we have three sets now, train, validation, and estes, we are going to scale the three. You know, before we've been scaling two sets because we have just two sets, but now we're going to scale the three. Scale the three sets. Okay, so we have X train STD. So we call on our scalar dot, what do we call on it? Do you remember? Fit, fit um, underscore transform. Exactly. Do you remember what the fit and the transform are doing? By this time, you should know it because I've been asking this. Yeah, yeah the, the fit will get the minimum and the maximum value. Mm -hmm. While the transform will now it will now use that um, the minimum and the maximum value to convert the the data to convert exactly. the data to 
as in to scale it, to scale exactly. the, the, um, the values. So, Mr. Halize, do you get that explanation? Do you understand that explanation? Yes. Okay, good. So the fit, we calculate the minimum and the maximum of each variable in the data. And then when we call transform, you use those minimum and maximum to scale each feature. The idea is to bring each feature to a range of zero and one. That's the idea. Okay, and then, so we pass in our X string. Uh, then for, we do for X val. For X val, we call scalar. Do we call fit transform or what do we call? Transform. Just transform. So we don't yes. want to calculate the minimum separately again and maximum. We just use the one we have gotten from the training to transform the validation and the test set. So we just pass x var. We do the same thing for x test. We call in our scalar. We call transform. And then we pass in our s test. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. OK, so we have achieved step, step three. And then we are now in the last step, which is to build the model. Step five is optional which could be uh, tune, we call it hyperparameter tuning. That is adjusting the parameters of the model. Hyperparameter tuning. Okay, so step four, we build the model. So now we want to use ridge regression. So we are going to import it. So ridge regression is in which, which module? Is in, uh, is in linear model. Linear model. So yes. from scikit-learn linear model, we import ridge. You can see, okay. Now is a class too, so we create an instance of the class. So we have reach. Let's use the default value. Then we'll train the model. How do we train it? How do we train it? We call dot feet. Okay. Then we pass in our training data, X train, XTD, the scaled one, and then our Y train. And then we can now check the accuracy, check the accuracy of the model on the training and the validation set. Is it making sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, so we can do let's let's make it beautiful. Print. Let's put this as train accuracy. So let's I want to do it to four decimal place. So dot format. And then we can call our model, which is reach dot score. That will give us the accuracy, which in terms of regression is called R square. It's called the, uh, we're trying to check the mean squared error. Remember that's the metric on the, that's the metric defined to check the error for regression problem. So we can check for both regression, XTD, and then we can uh, X, then we call on Y train now. So we can copy this and do the same thing for validation. So we do this, but we check, we we'll just call this validation accuracy. So this will be X var and this will be Y var. And then if we run this, so did I call, oh, I made a mistake. I didn't call it XCD. I didn't call this STD. I would like to do that so that I can have access to the original um, data. 
Do you get the, the idea? So always, it's good to always change, not use the same so that you can, it won't change the original data you have. Okay, now, see the training, see the validation, even though the data was small. So is there overfitting here? No, sir. So that was what I was telling that I'm, I wasn't sure there is any overfitting. The model did not overfit on it. Mm -hmm. So to so now move to what Mr. Alose was doing. So I won't do last, last one, but we can just do it for experiment sake. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's just do the lasso that I that we explained yesterday. Mr. Alose, are you are we together? So I'm here. Yeah, so we just do from, it's still from the um, linear module. Let's import a lasso. Then we'll create, create an instance of it too. So we have lasso and then we'll call this lasso and then we can build the model train the model. So we have sir, got fit. Yes. Me, sir. Mm -hmm. sir, we haven't met the, um, made the prediction. Yes, yes, we can do that. I will make the prediction with both. The, the, we, we can do that. One. I just want to we want to experiment last. So you can do that anytime. It doesn't matter. You already have a model. Mm -hmm. So when we do last or two, that will be another model. So we have one model here called reach. Another one is one want to build called lasso, and you can make prediction with any of the two. Hmm? Do you get? Yes, sir. Okay, so we can call X train STD, and then we can call um, Y train. Okay, and then let me just copy this guy. The, uh, to check accuracy and all of that. But this time around, it's going to be with lasso, not switch. Okay, so if you run that, you see that that was very poor. Yes, yeah, so. <laughs> because lasso can be very harsh. Sometimes, it, this so this is what we call underfitting. Do you get yes. This yes. So last, so that's why I told you yesterday. If you remember that, many have by many have said uh, Ridge perform better than Lasso, and I told you that I think one of the reasons because Lasso can be very harsh. However, if the features in our data are very much, Lasso will be a very good tool because. It will help us select the features that are just important. You get so, but it could be very harsh sometimes, especially when you don't have many features in your data. You can see. So, in this case, if we can check how many variables Lasso use, we can check. We can check the coefficient of Lasso. You know, we can check the coefficient and see. Look at it. Most are zeros. You see, only he only uses two features. Okay. You get now. Yes. Yeah, so it sets them um, almost everything to that. And that was what we are saying about lasso and reach. That reach we use, look at reach. Let me check the coefficients of reach. Reach we it will set those coefficients close to zero, but not exactly zero. So those coefficients were are still used to build the model. You see, you reach use everything except that some are close to zero more. Than all exactly. that, see this one minus one minus two close to zero. But for lasso, lasso we exactly set those coefficients of the variables that it feels they are not so important. It will set them to exactly zero, so it will not use them at all to build the model. It only uses two, just these two features, and then so that was why the accuracy was poor because no much information for the model to learn from. So sometimes lasso could be very, very hard. So that's why you can always try both on different, then you, you check. So, but we said that uh, lasso can be also be very good, especially to explain. 
the what the features in your variable that are very important because here now I can look for the location of this variable, which variables are, is it talking about? And to know which variable also is thinking is very, very important and all of that, you get. So that's, that summarizes lasso and regression. Any question on that? Any question? No, sir. No, okay. I'm sorry. So do you understand lasso and regression now? So you can see what we've just done here is what we call end-to-end -end machine learning. So we, you get the data. Suppose you have already explored, you have done all those things we did before, you visualize, you've derived some insight. Now you are ready to build model. You should be able to build model now. Get the features and the targets, split into training validation tests, scale the data, build the model, and then we can finally make prediction. Predict with the model. So, but because Lasso didn't perform well, we won't even use it. We just use the ridge. Predict with the ridge model, okay? So we, so we just call our ridge, let's call it, let's call this pred, starting for prediction then call our reach, put dot and press tab. If I press P, you can see I predict. And then press shift tab. You see, it only tells you to put in your X. What's your X? That is our X test. So we just pass in the S test. So the S test that we scale. So if I run this, let me call, let's check the result of the prediction. See the prediction. So, Alize, did you see that? Yes. So that's how to make prediction with your data. Is in array? Yes, of course now, because uh, the data is an array now. Remember, we converted it to an array by doing the dot, dot value. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, sir. You can always convert it back. So, but the pre you can always put it as a column name and all of that. Yeah. So, so this will be standing, uh, and then we can convert it back to look like the original. You can see. So here we have twenty four. Is predicting, you know, some. Other but but for you to be able to know it, you have to check it with the S test, the Y test. I mean, remember you are doing it on the S test, so we can you can check it with the Y test, like something like this, or we can put that in a new cell like Y test. So where we have twenty two point six is predicting 25.75. When we have 50, is predicting 23.25. So it may not be so accurate. So you can see 23 is predicting 28. When we have eight, is predicting 12. Do you get? When we have 21, it correctly predict 21. Do you understand that now? So yes, the, sir. the difference between this prediction and our Y, our original Y is what we call the loss, the error. So if you are doing something like neural networks, it will, it will not only just give you a single prediction. That one is going to be doing iteration. At every instance, it's going to be making prediction internally and be comparing it to the original output and then the change, like come up with a new coefficient values, generate prediction again, compare it and improve and improve. It does that over and over and over and over so that at the end, your model will be very, very, very good. That's why people are talking of deep learning neural networks. But Sir. This, wait, this kind of machine learning will only do it once. Only predict, like pre make prediction and that's all. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
so um, this neural network of it in, is it like, is, uh, because I'm trying to sense that it's like solving numerous um, differential equations, as in numerous <laughs> equations containing, containing different coefficients and all that. No well, one, we'll get there. <laughs> Those are part okay. of the thing we'll do in the, the master class. We'll look at you, will see what is going on there. It's just some mathematical formula, but we can we can say, we can summarize it that it's just a multiple, uh, like this one is just like, it, it's, a, it's a chain of layers where we can say one, each layer is just a single ridge regression. Let's say, let's say, okay? It's just a single, each layer can be like a single model. Okay. In, in a half chain of layers. So it's like build ridge regression. That's one layer. It makes prediction. We correct that prediction. We compare the prediction with the original output, the output that we are hoping for. And then it, it corrects it like, okay, maybe the problem is the weight. Let me adjust the weight and then rebuild the model again. Okay, okay. Make prediction, compare it, rebuild the model again. So by the time it does that over and over, it's just like normal principle of life. You you do something, you make mistake. You how do you know you make mistake? You compare it that oh, I think what I was supposed to get was two, but now I got five. Okay, you redo it, right? Okay, yes. But you worked on the knowledge that you had that okay, I think this was where I made the mistake. So you worked on that knowledge, you improved, but this time you didn't get two, but you got three. You redo it again. That's okay, exactly okay. What, what is going on in the neural network. So it's okay. like, but it has chain of layer, but those layer can just be seen as the same model, but they are passing their result. So one layer, we do the prediction, pass the result to the next layer. Next layer, we do the prediction, pass the result. So each layer is making use of the knowledge from the previous, the previous exactly the previous that's what is going on there but when okay. we get there you understand it very well okay sir. so that's why those models kind of be performed very well than all these we call these ones shallow models yeah but they thrive on data that's the that's the drawback the data should be large enough or else it will overfit mm -hmm. okay okay yes Okay, um, are we on the same page, Mr. Alos? I hope I didn't put you off. No, 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 I'm okay. Oh. At least it's, it's clear now, having listened to that uh, yesterday's video. Okay, good. So let's move to what we call the last uh, logistic regression. So this is just going to, you see, the idea of, uh, uh, the, we are still going to be following the same five, uh, five steps I put there. That's the same step. That step doesn't change. That's the same step. But what changes is the model, but the same step. Do you get? So once you get that steps, that's the same thing you are going to be doing. It's just what is we changing is that instead of reach, instead of lasso, we are using a different model. But you need to understand what that model is doing or what is going on inside the model. That's so. Okay? So let's look at last uh, logistic, I mean. Logistic regression, though it has the name, it's also a linear model, okay? It's a linear model. And I, I try to put that in this, um, uh, my, my PowerPoint here. You can see my PowerPoint, right? My slide. Can you? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So logistic regression is also a linear model, it is. But the, the main thing is that though it has the name regression, it is not a regression uh, algorithm. Algorithm, it's not. It's, so it cannot be used to solve regression problem. Remember regression problem, the goal is to predict what kind of output. Classification, sir. What kind of output, numeric or categories for regression? Categories, categories. For regression? Um, continuous numerical. Yeah, numerical. continuous. That's why we're predicting pr price of houses. 
Uh, that's why we're predicting, yeah, the price of houses, you can use it to predict oil production. So for me, the, the main model you are using, if your goal is to predict oil production, that will be regression. So either you use linear regression or you use lasso or re. However, there are other, all these other complex models that they, 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 some, they have both classification and regression. And you, you will see one like the KNRS neighbor. It has the another path for regression. So some of those models too, they've incorporated them as uh, the regression part into it so that you can use it for any of those. But the main one, the oldest uh, model that we use for, reg uh, for regression problem is a linear regression or uh, this linear regression then adjusted with ridge or lasso. That's all, but you can still use other complex one. But we'll get there. So logistic regression is a classification algorithm. It's a linear model. So it's, it, you can't use it for regression problem because it's a classification algorithm. It's used to predict categories, OK? And then, so we mostly use it for binary events. When I mean binary event, it means maybe the goal is to predict whether a, a patient has cancer or not. So two cases two events, cause cancer or not. Or maybe you want to build a model to predict who will win uh, a football match or oh, this thing will win or lose, so binary, okay? Uh, fraud detection, whether a fraud has taken place or not. Now, so, but the, the difference is that uh, between, I mean, linear, apart from the fact that it's a classification problem, it doesn't predict, it predicts values between zero and one. So we call, it gives us probabilities between zero and one, okay? So that's why I put something here that, oh, you can use to predict whether I cred, uh, credit card fraud has occurred. You, you can use to predict whether a patient has cancer or not. But look at it, instead of a regression, uh, linear regression putting a straight line to the observation, logistic regression try to smooth the curve. So the values are between zero and one, but it tries to come up with a curve that will give us a values between that zero and one. So the zero can be one category, one can be in another category. Zero can be where a credit card does not, did not occur, why one will be credit card fraud or cause, things like that. Okay, so um, let's look at how to, so what I put here is still using the same uh, the same question, they still using the same equation, okay? The same equation as linear regression. You can see the same equation I gave you. However, look at this last part. Instead of it predicting y hat, is on y hat will now be a category, will be whether, so you are setting a threshold that does, in this case, the threshold is zero, but in most cases, the threshold can be 0 0.5. So that means any probability values below 0 0.5, we mean we are predicting for the zero category. And any, uh, any values we are predicting above 0 0.5, we mean we are predicting the one category, meaning fraud or code. I don't know if you get the idea. That's what is going on inside. You are not the one that will set the threshold, but you could. However, that's what is going on in, internally. It's the same equation. It's, it's also trying to come up with coefficient. However, the coefficient is not to predict numeric values. No, the coefficient is to predict a probability value. And you know probability is between zero and one. But probability values below 0 0.5, where we are saying the 0 0.5 is the threshold, that anything, any probability values the model is predicting below the 0 0.5 should mean that we are saying no credit card fraud or cause or code. And any value above 0 0.5 should mean the credit card fraud or code. Do you get? Hello? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay, good. So, like I said, it's a linear model, and we know the one part, one strength of linear model is that it's very fast to train and to predict. Okay, um, we have explained all this regularization and all of that. So, but however, for logistic regression also has 
So look at the advantage of logistic regression. You know, for linear regression, it doesn't have a regularization term parameter. And that's why we use lasso and reach in case the model overfit. But logistic regression has in itself, it has a regularization parameter that we can tune to reduce uh, overfitting. Remember overfitting is when the mo train model perform well on the training data, but worse on the testing. And we said when the model overfit, that means the model is too complex for the training data. So one way we did, we said one is that to get more data or to reduce, to restrict those coefficient values by reducing their impact on the model. And that's what we call regularization. So logistic regression has a parameter called C. If you note, if you remember, what are the, or let me even ask you, what do you remember the regularization parameter in Ridge and Lasso? Do you remember? Yes, alpha. Alpha, but in logistic, it is C. Now this C, is inversely is the inverse of that alpha. Now, what do I mean? In for alpha, remember we said the more the values of alpha, the more the regularization you are applying, right? But for yes, sir. but for lasso is the inverse. The smaller the value of C, the more the regularization. So the higher the value of C, the less the regularization you are applying. Okay, so that's why I said higher values correspond to less regularization and vice versa. So it's just the opposite, the inverse of the alpha in lasso and ridge regression. So for this, for, uh, for just to make this faster, I'm just going to use it on the built-in data, but you can use it on your custom data. I've already shown you how to deal with this on custom data, loading the data, select the feature separately, select the target separately. Those are the step one and step two I, I did before. So I'm, the only difference in building data is that they've helped us to get the feature separately and the target separately. Do you understand? So I'm going to use the, uh, the data set in scikit-learn from scikit-learn data sets import, I want to use the, a data called the breast cancer data set. So it's called load breast cancer, this data. So it's a built-in data. You can use it and you can, but most time you will be using your own data like we did. You can, so, but for you, you are going to use the Titanic data. You can use the Titanic data. You may have to do some cleaning. We have done data cleaning before. So do, to use this Titanic data. So that'll be an exercise for you. So I've imported it to load it. Let me call it cancer and then load breast cancer. So then let's check the content of this cancer data. Let me use dot keys. Now look at what I have there. Look at the component. So the, the idea is that all of the built-in data in CycleLearn, they are all created similarly, the same way. They have the data component, that's the one that carries the entire data. They have the target, that's what we are trying to predict. They have the names of the target and they have the names of the variables, the features. And you can check them if you want to. Just call the cancer dot, if I call the target names, see, so this cancer, this data is about predicting whether a patient, the cancer condition of a patient is malignant. Malignant means is, you know, very dangerous or benign, meaning it's not that, you know, it's still, you can, you can treat it, you know, it's still, manageable, things like that. So, and you can check the entire data. You can check the dimension all of those things that we have done. But remember the data is, the data is actually in the data component, this data. If you, if you load this, you will see the data. You can see it's, it's in a non-power array. So this will represent our features and this target will represent our target. 
We can convert it to a data frame if you want to, and I can check the shape of this data. So 569 uh, rows, and it has 30 features, 30 columns, okay? We can actually convert it to a data frame if you want to, all right? So all we just need to do, let's call it cancer DF. I'm not going to use, I just want to show you. And then we can call on our data frame. Our data will be the cancer dot data because that's the, the data component of the cancer. And our columns will be the feature names in cancer. That's all. And I can check. I can check the head of my data. See. So it has 30 columns, 30 variables as we, as we saw here. As we saw, it has 30 columns. See, and you can scroll down. Look at all of them. Does it make sense? Are we together? Apologies, my, my network went off, so I just logged on again. Yeah, no worries, sir. Mr. Emmanuel, are we together? Yes, sir. Any yes, questions sir. so far? Mr. Alozi, um, any questions so far? Uh, it's just that um, it's like the data is in dictionary format. So it's not really, that, it's not really a dictionary. You get it. Okay, because I use dot keys, right? Exactly. Well, you don't need to bother yourself about that. Remember, you have your data, and you're on your own data, there's not, it's not in a dictionary for so you don't need this. What you need, your own data, you can see the, what they are doing is that they already have the data here, which we call the features, when, what, which is what I did here. Okay, and put them in features. And they have targets, which is what I did here. So you two can, you, you know how to do that, right? You can bring in your data, drop the target column to get your features and then select the target column to get your target. So that's what they have done for us before we loaded it. So the data, this is one that we call features. This is the one carrying the target. Target, targets. okay, okay. Do you understand? Yes. So that's just the main difference that they already helped us to segment them, to put the features separately from the target. And I've already shown you how to do that with your own data, right? Yes, sir. Mr. Alose, do you understand, sir? Yes. Okay, so now that we have the data, we have the features in the cancer.data, we have the targets in the cancer.target. What's the step? So what's the next step after getting that? We split. Remember, you split. After you split, you standardize the data normalize or scale it because they are in different ranges. Look at this one starting from zero, this one starting from 17 and all of that. So after splitting, you can normalize the data. After you normalize, you build the model, right? That's all. So let's split the data. Which function help us to split the data? I'm doing this over and over so that it, it will stay. Which function? Hello. Trend underscore test split. Okay, trend test split. With that function is located in which module? It's SKLN. SKLN is a package. There is a module inside SKLN that where that function is located. Do you remember? Model selection. Model selection. So from SKLN, from SKLN, if you put that and press tab, MO from CycleLearn model selection import, press tab, T, so we have train test split. Okay, create an instance of it, that's what I mean by instance sheet. So what do we, we have, so let me use, um, because the data is not like, let me just use two sets, but I've shown you how to use three sets, right? 
For your own project, you are going to use three sets, training, validation, and testing. I've shown you it here. So, but I will keep on, I will go back and be using my two sets. But I've shown you how to use three sets. Are we together? Yeah. Why train and why test? So we have train, test split. So we pass in our cancer dot data. In your case, that will be the features. Okay, and then cancer dot target. That's because of the way this data was arranged. So the target is located in the dot target of that cancer and the data is here. Then we can- we sir, can... sir, I have a question, sir. Go ahead, sir. Sir, for the previous, um, uh, this thing we did, the mm -hmm. exercise we did, mm -hmm. is there no way we can also determine the, the what I mean, the accuracy of our prediction you know, based on the actual value? Is there no parameter or is there no function for so what we can actually get that's to. a good question. And that will lead us to what we call confusion matrix. That's the plan. So that's where we help us to quantify our prediction. Hmm? That's where we are going. Okay? okay? Okay, sir. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. So remember, so we can we can stick with the uh, default, which is 75% and 25% or we can use 20 and 80. Let's use 20 and 80. So we just specify the test size to be 0 0.2. And then remember we set the random state for reproducibility. Okay, now we have the train test data. If you want to check the dimension, you can. Let's check x train dot shape, uh, x test. Dot shape. So we are using four four five four five five to build. Or do you want me to use three sets? It's two sets. Fine, you understand, right? How to do three sets, right? Yes, sir. We understand. Yes, sir. But yes, but you can. If you want to add that one, you can. But it's no problem if you don't want to. Okay, so let's do that. X val so that uh, X string and X val Y train Y val. So we have the train train test split. We pass in our X string this time around. I will pass in our white train. So if we check our X val now, dot shape. So now 341 is to build, 114 is to validate, and same 114 is to test, right? So what's the next thing? We'll scale, right? We'll scale. Yes, sir. Uh, so, um, so to do that, to scale, which function are we using to normalize our data? Which function? Mean underscore max scalar. Mean max scalar or standard scalar. So let me use standard scalar. We have okay. been using mean max scalar, but it's same. Standard scalar, we just, it, it will make sure you scale our data so that they have a mean of zero and standard deviation of one, that's all. So if, if you call the fit, it's just going to calculate the mean and calculate the standard deviation. If you now call transform, it will use it to scale the data such that they all, to scale each variable in the data to make sure that they all have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, that's all. So let's, from, but you can use mean mass scalar. There's nothing, there's no difference actually in the results. So from SKLN pre-processing, import standard scalar. We can instantiate it. Let's call it scalar, standard scalar. Then let's use it to scale our X strain and uh, so let's call this X string STD. 
So we call our scalar the fit underscore transform, and then we'll pass in our X string. For X test, X val and X test, remember we only call transform, right? So, and then we yeah. pass in our X val. The same thing for X test. We call our scalar dot transform, and then we pass in our X test. No, I will. We must remember to make this X test STD. And then step four, step four now, or step three is to build the model. So let's import the model. In this case, we want to use logistic regression. It's also a linear model. So it's in the SKLN linear model. Imports logistic regression. And then I can create an instance of it. Let me call it log reg. So I have logistic regression. Let me use the default parameter for now. And then we can build the model dot fit. So passing on the X train, XTD, Y train. And then we can check the accuracy. So we call print train accuracy. So we do dot format. And then we pass in our model logreg.score. And then we have the X train XTD and our Y train. And then let's do this for the validation. Remember, don't check the accuracy on the test set if you're using three sets. Don't do that. If you do that, your model will, will steal information in the uh, test set. And that way, over time, if you keep doing that, it will understand the pattern in the data and it may give you very good score. However, that score is not reliable. It may deceive you. <laughs> so that's why you, that's why we normally advise three sets. Do everything you want to do on the validation. Keep the test set away from the training. Let that be the last thing that you do. So in this way now, we can check, oh, sorry, this is S validation. <laughs> I was just about doing what I said you shouldn't do. So I must have done something wrong here. I, because I put Y train, it should be Y var. So look at it. Training score 98%, not, validation score 99%. Wow, this is a generalized. Um, <laughs> So logistic regression can be very powerful, actually. can be very, very powerful. There was a project I did recently to build, uh, uh, it's a classification uh, model. I tried it with more advanced. And funniest thing was that simple model gave IS accuracy. Yeah. <laughs> it gave very good logistic regression and, and a model we're going to talk about next week called KNN, KNRS neighbor, gave the IS. OK. So we have normalized, so we don't need to do this step. Uh, we have done that. It's always good to do it before you build the model, okay? So suppose the model overfit, you can do what I, what, we, what I put here. Like, it's just like for loop. I've shown you this kind of loop before. So this is like, I want to adjust the, these are the, like, you know, I told you we have a regularization term. If I put shift tab, you see it here. You have a regulation time called C. The, the default value is one. If the model overfit, you might need to reduce this value because the smaller the value of C, the more regularization. So if you want to apply more, regular, more regularization, you can reduce this value and then rebuild the model. So that's what I was trying to do here that suppose this model overfit, we can set different values of C. It doesn't have to be this. Since I know that the default value is one, I just put some values below one. Then I put my training accuracy at 
and then my this one should be validation accuracy since I'm using three sets. But I don't need to do that in this case because the model did not overfit. But suppose it does. You can come up with different values of C to test. And then you can build the model and store the accuracy there and visualize it. That may be easy to explain to others. So I'm saying for C in values of C, just using for loop that you've known. The very first time is going to pick this. And I'm saying instantiate the model using the values of C that I'm picking, train the model. This will be X train STD, and then store it, my X train STD, store it in this uh, training accuracy and do the same thing, store. But this time around, it will be X validation, not X test, because we're using three sets. So this is X val. And this will be validation. But remember, Can I ask a question? Go ahead, sir. Okay, I hope I'm not going to take us back. No, no. On the, when we did the uh, prediction in um, Lasso, mm -hmm. and we had some array, no, array of numbers, mm -hmm. can we input it in back into the original data, then make a plot like one we have in this? Um, or I'll have below. So all we just need to do was just to create, in this case, we just create additional column in our original data and save it by and save it there. But remember the length of the prediction. The length of uh, this was the length of the prediction was just with the Y test, the Y test, not the exact data. Do you remember? Yes. The length of this prediction will be equal to the length of the y. The length of this prediction will be equal to the length of the y test because um, we are predicting on s test. Do you get? So is if you want to do it, you can say I'm not predicting on the entire data. So the idea is this. Sir. Once you have done, yeah, you can. To answer your question, you can. But before we make prediction, most times, eh, after we have been, we have tested it, we have built the model, we've adjusted it with validation, we've, we are now okay with it. Hmm? We test it on the, uh, so even most time before you test it, you will now combine the validation data with the training data, because you are good, you are okay with the model based on the validation result. Huh? You are not going to combine the training data with the validation to make it one data. And then you make prediction, and then you rebuild the model now with the combination of the training and the validation before you make prediction. However, what I want to say before was, the length of your prediction is on the text. Is with the is on the test is is going to be equal to the length of the test data because you are making prediction on the test data. So if you want to visualize it, you might have to create convert the test set like this. This is what I'm saying. Um, where did we? So this was where we make the prediction, right? Now we have the white test here. I can create these two as a column, as a data frame. The white test and the prediction alone. I can say, uh, just let's call it DF1. I will just call PD dot data frame. And then, or I, or I put the two before like, okay, my data is create a dictionary. The key is white test. And the value, the value is what we have here as Y test. Hmm? I have another key, which is prediction, right? Yeah. And the value is what we say, what we call the prediction. And then in my data frame, my data is equal to my data. So if I do this, if I check df1.ed, 
uh, what is it? Let's see. Y test, Y test, prediction. So what? Arrays must be of the same length. So something has happened now. So my prediction is does not have the same length as this Y test because yes. that's because. Uh, let's see. Oh, I have to rerun it because I'm using this original, this, this same name that I've used here now. White S, White S, all these, these ones. These ones I've just done here. You know, it's the same name. So it doesn't know that I'm not referring to that same White S. So to do that, we have to go back and rerun this, uh, this script. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Because I've used a name called white test on that that we are doing before you called me back. So it doesn't yeah. know that I'm not referring to the same white test again, I'm referring to this one. So if I, I will have to rerun it, but this is the idea. Cre I'm creating a new data frame, then I can use matplotlib to visualize as scatter plot. Do you get Okay, no problem. Yeah. But do you, do you get what, my, what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Yeah. So he, he's, he doesn't know, he's using the same white test. So that's why he's saying he's, they don't have the same length. Yeah. Okay, so that's the idea. But like this one, this plot I'm showing, you don't have to because this model did not overfit. But suppose, come up with different values of C and then just run a loop to check each values and then for each one store it and then you can finally visualize uh it like like we did like i'm trying to do here but i'm sure this will not really you can see for all the values our validation accuracy is higher and that's the kind of model we want we want the validation to be higher so you can see that even when we use 0.2 that means if I use, if I set C to be 0 0.2, this model will give me perfect model, right? That's where adjusting come. It doesn't mean that yes. you can, it doesn't mean that it's only when you want to regularize, like for overfitting that you use regularization or no. This process is what we call hyperparameter tuning. That step I put here, step five, that, but I said it's optional. This step that I wrote here, Hyperparameter tune. That's what we call tuning your 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 model. Are we together? So if I, now that I use this, I saw that okay for anything from 0 0.2 to 0 0.6, it will give me a very very perfect model. I can just use the smallest one, 0 0.2. So I will rebuild the model. I can call it now log reg, maybe log reg one instead of the same name so that we have two different models. I can show people the original model and then the new model that I have now. Are you with me? So now we're going to have logistic regression, but we are now going to use C of 0 0.2 now, the, the value instead of the default value of one. I don't know if you get what I'm doing. Yes, sir. So I can copy all of these I've done. Remember, we have already scaled, so you don't need to do that. So I can just copy all of these and then go, just go and paste it there and rerun it to see if, if this visualization was correct. But remember, it's log, I'm giving a new name, log reg one, one, one. You can give it a new name. So I'm training it on this and then I'm checking it on the validation. You see now? This gives us a very wow. good model, perfect model, wow. 100%. So now that I'm okay, that okay, I just need to be using values of C to be two. I will not, so this is my new model, not the original log reg, is a log, log reg one. The final thing I'm going to show you now today is how to save your model and reuse for future prediction so that you don't keep on training every time. Once you've gotten to this kind of perfect model, you just save it. You are going to save it and then next time to, for prediction, I don't need to retrain it. I will just load the model and then call dot predict on it on my new test data and it will work. Does it make sense? 
Yes, sir. So that is it. That's where, where this is what we call hyperparameter tuning, meaning you are changing the values of some important hyperparameters to rebuild the model just with the goal of improving the performance of the model. And one key parameter here is the value is C for logistic regression. And you can see when we tuned it, we got just by increasing it to two, we got good, uh, in fact, a perfect model. Yeah. Any question? I don't know if this no, sir. if this thing is becoming clearer now. It's becoming it's, clearer. It's becoming it's, very it's interesting. Becoming, it's becoming clearer. <laughs> okay, good. It's becoming clearer though, and then more interesting. Good. Yeah. So that's it. That's 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 why a data scientist is not just going to run, try it once and say, okay, now this is my final model. No, you always want to get the best. So you are going to keep changing parameters, keep trying different models, but the same step, the same. You can see it was the same step we used for the lasso regression reach, that same thing, same step, except that the model is now logistic regression. The same step, get the data, get your features and the target, normalize it, build the model, adjust the parameters using this approach that we just did now. That's called hyperparameter tuning. Check it on the validation, tune it, change the values if it's not, if that's not the, if you, you want to, or you always want to squeeze out the best accuracy. Tune it, tune it more and more until you get the best. That's the, that's the same step you are going to be doing, but you will try different models for the same problem, different, and pick the best. So to wrap up today, I will, teach, I will show another metric instead of the accuracy. I will show another metric, which we call the confusion matrix. And from it, we will get the precision recall and F measure. I'll tell you the important when you should mainly focus on recall and precision. You can use them every all the time, but they are mostly important when your data is in balance. Your second project will be a, an imbalanced data. In the past, people built the model for me without, without handling the problem of imbalances in the data. And they got very high accuracy, but I can bet them that the accuracy is not reliable because the model is simply predicting the most occurring the class. When I mean imbalance, it means that for the target, the target, uh, you know, like we have here, you have target to be zero and one, malignant and benign. It means that one class is occurring far more than the other. Maybe one class is only occurring 10% in the data and the other is occurring 90%. The model can give you very high accuracy, but that accuracy is not reliable because it's simply predicting the most occurring class. And if you stop there, you will think, the model is doing awesomely. However, it's bad. I don't know if you get the idea of what I'm trying to say. So for, for that kind of data, you don't use accuracy or you don't stop only with accuracy. You use other metric I will explain now called recall and precision or F measure. That those ones will help us to truly understand, like to they will weight the the, the 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 classes based on the proportion that you have. So whatever recall performance or precision you are getting, those ones will be reliable. Then I will show us later how to undo that problem of imbalances, like how to balance the data. There is an approach for it. I will show us later. So not to waste much of the, uh, too much time, there are uh, the measures we have here, another measure to complement the accuracy of it is called confusion matrix. What is confusion matrix? It's just a two by two table. So where the rows are what we call the actual values, the column are the predicted values. There are four entries in this confusion matrix. 
The first one is the true positive. We have the false positive, the false negative, and the true negative. True positive means someone like, for example, yes, someone is pregnant and your model is truly predicting that the person is pregnant. That means the model is doing well. We call that true positive. The negative class means someone is not pregnant. And that's the one you are seeing at the bottom here. The person is not pregnant. Obviously, a man cannot be pregnant. And your model is correctly predicting that he is not pregnant. That's what we call true negative. Why is it negative? That's the not class, not, not pregnant, not cancer. So that's, and it's correctly predicting that it's not negative. So this is true positive, this is true negative. Now, the false positive and the false negative are where our model, models are making mistakes. That's where the model is making mistakes. False positive means the person, obviously a man is not pregnant, but the model is saying the person is pregnant or the person is not a criminal. Okay, and the model is saying you are a criminal. The model is predicting that the person is a criminal. So the judge can jail the person. The person can go to jail because the model said based on the attributes that this person have, it, and that we have in the data, in the past data, this person is a criminal. That's false positive. False negative means a model is in statistics, they call that type one error. A false negative is type two, meaning the model is saying this person is a criminal, but the person is saying the model is saying that he's innocent. So the person shouldn't go to jail, but the person is a criminal. So just like here, we have that the person is pregnant, but the model is saying she's not pregnant. And, and it's clear that we could see that this person is pregnant. Do you, do, you have the, do you understand true positive, false positive? Do you understand? Yeah. Yes, sir. So those two now, in reality, you might have to battle with which one should I care for more? Should, should, it, should I prefer, I mean, we want the first positive and first negative because those are where their model is making mistakes to be as slow as possible. But in this case now that which one should I, do we prefer more? Can we still wrap, like, can we still uh, try to accept a model saying someone is a criminal when the person is not a criminal, the person should go to jail when he's innocent, than saying, no, he's not a criminal. Meanwhile, the person is a criminal. That's like false negative. A false positive is like, oh, you are, you, are, you, are, you are a criminal. You are a criminal. Meanwhile, the person is not. That's false positive. A false negative, you are not a criminal. You are innocent when the person is a criminal. So we might have to, which one should we prefer? And that's case, if there's no true answer, there's no false answer. It depends on the scenario. You know, it's just like, we want to build a model to detect fraud. Do we prefer to say, oh, this person, uh, our model to predict like, oh, fraud has occurred. This person just performed, just, uh, uh, just actually uh, carry out a fraud. Meanwhile, the po there is no fraud. The, the, the person did not actually do any kind of fraud, you know, so. Or then for a model not to catch it, like, oh, fraud occurred, but the model say there's no fraud. We might have to battle along with that. Which one do we prefer? Which one should we focus on? Do you understand the idea? Yes, sir. <laughs> so that's where you sit down with the stakeholder. Okay, these are the mistakes the model is making. Which one should we really, really focus more on here? Which one? So then discussion will go on a lot of that. <laughs> so before you can go on with the metric. Okay, now, how, so if you understand that, so this, this kind of table is what we call the confusion matrix. Now, the, if to get recall, recall is just the true positive divided by true positive plus false negative. Like true positive 
divided by the addition of true positive and false negative. And what is it saying? Recall it's saying out of all of the uh, cases, the positive cases we have in our, in our data, like out of all the people that we assume that out of all the pregnant people, which one is our model? How many does our model predict as truly being pregnant? So that's what we mean by true positive, whereby true positive plus false negative. That's recall. So recall is saying out of all the people pregnant, out of all the cr criminals, okay, how many did our model truly predict as being pregnant or as being criminal? That's recall. Precision is saying true positive over true positive plus false positive. This place is saying out of all the, the prediction that our model makes, out of all the prediction that it makes for positive class, that is out of all the positive prediction it makes, how many are truly positive? Remember the positive prediction are those who they are truly pregnant. The model said they are truly pregnant. And some are not pregnant, but the model is saying is pregnant. So that's the positive class. Or even in criminal case, you are not, you are, you are a criminal, the model is saying you are a criminal. And you are not a criminal, the model is still saying you are a criminal. That's positive. So out of all the positive prediction, how many are truly criminal? How many did model predict? correctly as criminal or how many model pretty correctly as pregnant that's precision out of all the positive prediction how many did he uh, uh, were actually positive recall is out of all the positive classes in the data how many did the model predict positive do you do you get the idea hello we are here. <laughs> okay. Very more, yeah, this, this one is very more of mathematics. mathematics. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's even statistics. And you will need it because to explain your model, this, these are even more explainable, like explain models more, the result, than just accuracy. Because accuracy will not always give the, the uh, what is going on in the model. And I told you for imbalanced data, accuracy will not be accurate. We actually we be we give you an overly optimistic result, which is not reliable. I'm just trying to explain what recall and precision mean. We can get it with code in one line, but I'm just trying to explain what they mean so that you can interpret them. Okay, Mr. Emmanuel, are we together? Yes, sir. As you don't worry, as you watch it, if you watch the video over and, over, and then you go through the notes, you understand it better. Okay, so pre F measure is just combining the precision and recall, which is two times precision plus times recall divided by the sum of precision and recall. Let's see how to use all of this on our model. Remember, our best model so far is the log reg one that gave us perfect prediction. Let's check. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Excuse sir. sir. Yes, sir. So you can only apply the confusion matrix for logistic. Uh, for classification, for classification model. Yeah, model. Okay. Yes, classification, yes. Okay. Not regression problem, yeah. Okay. okay, so this is in the metrics module, metrics, because they are metrics. So it's in the metrics module in scikit-learn. So from scikit-learn uh, metrics, import. So I'm going to import a couple of them. We have accuracy score if you want to get it manually, like without using the dot score that we use. You can use accuracy underscore score. We have the average precision score. So I'm going to use, I'm going to call on confusion matrix classification report. Classification report is just a to beautify the confusion matrix. Just, yeah, it's almost the same thing, but just an expanded form of confusion matrix. So I'll call on classification reports. I will also call, I will use the F1 score that I talked about. I will also the recall score for, for recall, uh, precision 
score. And the final one is the confusion matrix. So we'll, we'll see all of them, okay? So, but the first thing you have to make prediction on the data. So let's call this our Y pre. So we call on our model log reg, log reg one. And then we'll call on dot predict. So you can see you have the predict and then you have the predict proba. If you want to predict probabilities, you use the predict underscore proba and then we can manually set a threshold for it and all of that. But if you want to predict the class, the zero and one or one and two, blah, blah, you use the dot predict. Then we we'll pass in our X test. Remember, we have not used the X test. We use the, -valid the validation. So we can use the S test now, okay? Uh, you can still use the validation to predict. Yeah, that doesn't mean, but let's use it on the test set. So S test STD, okay? And then we can call on, Let's call. Let's instantiate of the thing that we we imported confusion. So call on confusion matrix. It takes two arguments: the true uh, y, that's the true target, and the predicted one. Okay, it's trying to. It's going to be checking the difference between the predicted. If you remember this. We have the actual values, which is the Y test and the predicted one, which is what we are, the prediction we are going, we, 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 are, we get with this line. Are you with me? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The same thing, we can do the classification reports, class reports. So the classification report will only work after you have done confusion matrix because it's just to beautify the confusion matrix. So we call sir, on, yes? So this, um, for the confusion matrix, can we also apply it in the train, in the train data sets? Yes, you can, but is, that means you are making, you are going to make yeah. prediction. So you are using the prediction you made for the training. You know, the reason we don't, you can, but, we don't use it because we are not basically interested in the training data. I hope you know. We are we only use the build our model. We're interested in how this model will perform on data it has not seen before. I hope okay. you know. That's why you are building okay. model. Do you get so it will generally perform well on the training because it has seen the data before. That was data that was used to build the model. So you see, if you make prediction on the training, if we do this log reg one dot predict on the training, you may be shocked, you may be shocked that we might get 100%. Like it will be perfectly match it because that was the data that was used to build it. It's just like giving you the same exercise that we gave you five minutes ago and you got, you, you, you missed only two and you've seen the correction and I'm giving you the same question. Won't you get everything? You I will, I will. That, that's exactly, exactly. What, what it means passing uh, training data to this model again. Uh, so that's why we are always interested in the data it has not seen before. Okay. We only use, yeah. Okay, so let's use the, the same thing for the, all of them will take Y test and the prediction, all of them, all of these things. They are making comparison with, so we can do our recall so the recall score, why is this double E? This is for me. This should be, it should be one E. It's nothing like double E. Yes, let me, be, let me double check. Yeah, it's one E. So, mm -hmm. okay, recall score. We're passing Y test and Y prediction. We do the same thing for precision. Precision score, Y test and the prediction. 
Okay, I think we are good now. Okay, the last one is the F measure. F measure. So we we'll call on our F1 score. And then Y test, Y pre. You don't have to do all of this. I only did it just to explain. Okay. So we can run all of this. Something is wrong. Classification reports. What did I miss there? So it said from psychometry import trailing comma with not allowed. Oh, sorry, at the end there. Okay, are we together? So let's check it one by one. Hello? Hi. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I just want to be sure. Okay, let's let's check. Let's check the class, let's check the confusion matrix to see, you know, confusion matrix. Let me, let's put it in a new line. That's why I put that forward, that backward slash N. So we do dot format to put in a new line there. I can put my conf, that stands for confusion matrix. So if we run that, you see, so where it makes mistake is this three and one. Do you see that? So this that's the false positive and the false negative. So it's making mistakes three times and one time. Like out of all the positive class, it makes mistake. It wrongly classifies three patients. Okay, and the first neg is like he's saying this person has cancer. Meanwhile, the person does not have cancer. Three people out of 47 people. And out of 45 people, so the, so out of the 45 people, like all the 45 people this predicted, like the positive class is saying it misclassified one. So he's saying this person doesn't have cancer. Meanwhile, the person has. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to explain, confusion matrix is good. So to beautify, we can we can just call on uh, uh, the classification report. The classification report will actually give us everything, including accuracy, precision, and all of that. Yes. It will give us all of those ones, classification. And then we call these class underscore reports. You see? So now is a report. So you can see, give us the precision, but they give us the precision on the two classes, the zero classes and the one classes. It finally give us the accuracy on the test set. Remember this on the test set, 96% on the test set. You can see, though the validation is 100%, but on the test set, it is still good. 96% of them, despite the data we used to build it. So 96%, the model is going to be correct. The precision on, on each class, the record, the F score, it gives you. And for the, the, the other class, it gives you that. Okay, but you can manually check the precision. You can manually check the precision and the record and the F measure we can. So we can just pass in precision here. You can see the percent precision is 95.6, which is similar to uh, this, it, because this is on the positive class, on the one class, which is approximately 96 that classification report is giving you. We can check that for record too. It's going to be uh, something like 99, and then we can interpret it. You can interpret it. Recall. You see, it's approximately 99. So 98.5, it rounded up to 99. You see that? So remember how to interpret this recall. Recall is out of all the positive 
uh, prediction. Because it's, remember I told you it's true positive plus, true positive over true positive plus false negative. Out of all the positive prediction, yeah, out of all the positive uh, uh, classes, sorry, out of all the positive classes that we have, how many that model truly predict correctly? So this is saying, out of all the people who has cancer that we know in our data, how many, what, uh, what, how many did our model, what percentage does our model truly predict as having cancer? That was a good one. It predicted of close to 99% of them as being positive. So this is more explain, ex, ex, explanatory. If you want to explain the results, it's always good to do this kind of stuff. So this is saying, out of all the people who has cancer in their data, our model was able to predict 99% of them correctly as having cancer. But precision is saying, out of all the prediction our model did, out of all the, the, the people that our model predicted as having cancer, what percentage truly has cancer? 95, 96% of them. Do you, do, 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 does it make sense? Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yeah. And if you want to check the rec or the, file, the F measure, you can just do that. But we know it's going to be 97%. So F measure is just a combination of recall and uh, precision. Any question before we before we I stop uh, today's class, Mr. Al, is there any question? No, not from me. Even though by the time I listen to the the uh, the recording tomorrow, mm -hmm. I will understand it far far better. But at least I appreciate it now. Oh, okay, good. So it's just that uh, you, you need the 